That's part of the reason why I'm doing this God is series. Because I want you to know that even though you may be on this place in your journey where you're not fully understanding of that, it's okay. You're still going to hear the good news of who God is. And so God is present always, and that was last week. This week, the uh, message is about God who is, or God is savage. The word savage means fierce. The word savage means cannot be controlled. The word savage in the context of grace means this, that God in God's character and God in God's character of grace cannot be controlled. It's absolutely fierce and free of our control and God is determined and determines that this same grace, this word grace meaning this, undeserved, unreserved, meaning unconditional, love and forgiveness. So God determines who and what receives grace, and then God determines that all of us receive that grace. So in a lot of ways, God is unlike us in our approach to people, and God is unlike us because God is fierce in ensuring that all of us understand and know this grace. So here's the most ridiculous story you'll ever hear in the scriptures in the Old Testament about grace. This is the most ridiculous and unsafe story that you will ever hear. I find this story absolutely absurd. The Old Testament could be a rated R movie, and this story is rated R. So if you have small children in here, tell them to go to Sunday school because that's where they should be right now because they're not going to hear about this story. But they are, you will hear it now. So this story is about a prophet, a real story about a prophet by the name of Hosea and his wife, unfaithful wife, Gomer. And so I, I listened to I, listen, I watch baseball. You know this is my favorite time of the year. I was just talking to the band about this, and it's funny for me. The band, I said to the band, I said, I'm exhausted this morning. I'm wondering why. And then I realized that we're doing baseball practice right now. And baseball practice has me going from one field to another field, practicing with boys. I'm exhausted. But I love baseball because if you notice in baseball, if you go to a game with baseball, there's walk-up music, right? You know that walk-up music, that, that walk-up music is the music that is being played when a player comes to home plate for his at-bat. So I'm like saying to myself, what would be Hosea's walk-up music? Now Chase Utley, his walk-up music when he played for the Phillies was Casmer by Led Zeppelin. One of, my, one of my favorites. Shane Victorino, Buffalo Soldier by Bob Marley. Roy Halladay, Good Times, Bad Times, again, Led Zeppelin. So I think that Hosea, if he was coming up the bat, and he, in a you know, symbolic way, he was coming up the bat, he was coming up the bat, he was doing exactly what God told him to do. Hosea's walk-up music would be Roxanne by the police, Right? Roxanne, you don't have to put on the red light. Those days are over. You don't have to sell your body to the night. Roxanne, you don't have to wear that dress tonight. Walk the streets for money. You can't care if it's wrong or if it's right. Roxanne. Now, I'm not Sting. All right, so I'm not going to sing it like he does. But I am sure that if you hear that on the radio, if you're like me, you listen to 1029 Classic Rock, you, if you're like me, you listen to that, and when that song comes on, you have to sing it, right? Exactly. Thank you, David Convery. 
So, the story starts like this. When the Lord first spoke through Hosea, the Lord said to Hosea, now, this is the fun part. This is where the story gets rated R. Karen texted me yesterday and said, hey, Chuck, are you sure you want this translation? I said, of course I want this translation. It's the closest one to the Hebrew. Go take yourself a wife of whoredom and have children of whoredom, for the land commits great whoredom by forsaking the Lord. There's three times they bring up the word whore in the scriptures. It's crazy. This is an absurd, ridiculous story. By the way, Sue Knight ran her granddaughter out of here quicker than quick. I saw that. So, she, so he went and took Gomer, and she conceived and bore him a son. Again, abrasive, absurd, it happened. Then the Lord said to him, Name him Jezreel, for in a little while I will punish the house of Jehu for the blood of Jezreel, and I will put an end to the kingdom of the house of Israel. We're very particular about the names that we name our children, right? We're very particular about how we name our children because we want our children to have, our, their names to have some kind of meaning or presence within our lives. And some of those names are popular, some of those names are classic, but never do I, have I have ever met anybody who's ever named their kids after Hosea had to name his kids after their relationship that God was having with the nation of Israel. In other words, this relationship, unique and absurd, and will never ever happen again in the scriptures, Hosea was asked, was told to have a relationship with this woman who was unfaithful, and then name his kids in this way. Basically to say, by the way, you've been unfaithful, you've been unfair, you have caused me a great deal of pain, judgment is coming. She conceived again and bore a daughter. Now, the Lord then said to him, name her this is the part I hate about the Old Testament. Thank you. Name her this. <laughs> Basically, name her this because I no longer have mercy. I can no longer forgive. Basically saying you've been horrible. No good people. And then they had a third child. <laughs> they had a son. And God takes it a step further to illustrate what he could do. Easily could have pronounced judgment and said, you are no longer my people. Now the story continues, and Hosea was sharing this, telling this, proclaiming this, reminding the people of Israel, by the way, you have hurt God, God is, and you get the feeling, right? You, if you're listening carefully to what God is saying to Hosea, and Hosea is then saying to the nation of Israel, you kind of can hear, you can hear what God is experiencing with this moment. Judgment's coming. You're not my people. And you can hear the experience of God in God's story with an unfaithful people and hearing the frustration, the anger, and even, what? Grief. 
that the people of Israel have been unfaithful, have lacked gratitude, who's only in it with with God, in this relationship with God, just to receive and not to give, and showed no concern for their neighbor, no matter who they were. So the story continues. And he basically, he gives them this warning that if you don't get your act together, this is what will happen as a result of the consequences of the life that you choose to live. So the story continued and remained the same. The Lord said to me again, Hosea, go love a woman who has a lover and is an adulteress, just as the Lord loves the people of Israel, though they turn to other gods and love raisin cakes. By the way, I don't know what raisin cakes are. I don't know the significance of raisin cakes. They must be really good. Now, if you watch The Line, The Witch, The Wardrobe, or you read the book, there's a snack in there that really lures Edmund away from that path that that God has for him, or at least that's what they want you to know and, and realize. I'm not sure what the... And I don't care. This is the part I want you to hear. As Roxanne is playing in the background of your mind. Go love a woman who has a lover that is an adulteress. In fact, go back again. So here's what happened. Hosea has a relationship, marries Hosea. They conceive three children, and and Gomer returns to the life that she had before. Even though she had it good, she returns back to the way she had life before. And so God sends up this flare of warning again to remind them to remind them to remind them through Hosea and his relationship with Gomer, go and love this woman again. Go and love her again. Then you hear Hosea say, God says through Hosea to Gomer as an illustration to his love for his people, even though they are unfaithful, here in the tone of this verse, in verse 3, you must remain. Hosea is pleading with Gomer to remain. You shall not play the whore. You shall not have intercourse with a man, nor I with you. You hear a sense of pleading on the part of Hosea with Gomer that represents the bigger story of God pleading with his people. It is one of the most absurd, ridiculous stories that you will ever hear in the Bible. It is one of the most ridiculous, absurd stories that you'll ever hear me preach. It is one of the most absurd stories that you will have to chase your children downstairs to Sunday school because you just don't, you're not ready for them to hear these words yet. Because of how deep this relationship is that God has with his people. There's a song by the Lumineers. That's Roxanne. There's a song by the Lumineers, and the song the Lumineers wrote is called Stubborn Love, and I love this song. Nathan, we were, actually came up on my shuffle this morning as we were rolling in to Delanco, and I, I like to play my Jesus music before I come here. It kind of gets me ready. I listen to my Jesus music, and then I listen to the Man Van mixtape as we're leaving and we're rolling out. And... The song, Stubborn Love, came up in that shuffle in my Jesus music. I 
have to think that this is God's theme song. She'll lie and steal and cheat and beg you from her knees, make you think she's, make you think she's mean it, she means it this time. She'll tear a hole in your heart, the one you can't repair. But I still love her. I don't really care. I have to think that this is God's theme song with his people. I have to think that this is what the song that God was singing or trying to convince his people that we see in Hosea and the people who were un, literally unfaithful chose to serve and to worship lesser gods and only kept God, the big G, around so that they would have a good luck charm for protection from other nations. And so I hear this song, I hear this story, and I realize, and I'm blown away by the reckless nature, or at least we perceive it as reckless when it really isn't all that reckless, but there's a freedom that, or a, God is, has a fierce, savage love for his people. And I am absolutely amazed by that. See, God is savage, meaning you can't control God and who God chooses to love. God is savage and he's fierce because he can't be controlled and his love can't be controlled by who he chooses to love within our lives. See, this story, this absurd, ridiculous, real story of Hosea and Gomer, this relationship that was going on, was rep represented, showed, exemplified this love that God has for the nation of Israel, the nation is if, of Israel that decided that they would choose their own path. And you almost hear in this story, all 11 chapters, or at least all the 11 chapters that I read, by the way, you hear this back and forth inside of God's head and heart. Abandon them or love them? Love them or let them choose their own path and figure it out on their own? Love them in spite of themselves or find a different people? Verse uh, chapter 11. Oop. I don't care. Whatever. Listen. How can I give you up, Ephraim? How can I hand you over? How can I treat you like this other nation? My heart recoils within me. My compassion grows warm and tender. I will not execute my fierce anger, and I will not destroy again. How can I give you up? How can I hand you over? My heart and my need for justice. Justice means you get what you deserve. My heart stands against my need to scold you, to follow through with my judgment, 
my heart stands against what you deserve. My heart stands against allowing you to live without my presence. My compassion grows warm and tender. And I will not allow my fierce, notice that word, savage anger to determine my relationship with you. Now, most of us are here saying, you realize that this story is about God's relationship with you? See, he's not talking to the other nations. He's talking to his people. He's talking to his followers. He's talking to us and saying, by the way, I hope you haven't forgotten, but when you faithfully follow me, it's because of my grace. It's because of my love. It's because I initiated this relationship with you. And I've done everything and bend over backwards for you to remind you I love you. I choose to love you. And you aren't receiving what you deserve. And I'm like, I've messed up. Wow. Now, most of you, maybe not. But if we're really honest with ourselves, there are things in our lives that are messed up. And if we're honest with ourselves, there are relationships in our lives that are messed up. And so the grace that God has willingly given to you It's the same grace that you should be willing to give. This savage nature of God, this uncontrolled love, that God's love cannot be controlled and passed out to those that we believe deserve that love, by the way. The very nature of God's love says you don't deserve it. The very nature of God's grace says you don't deserve it. The very nature of what God is in your life and your relationship with other people and how we choose to be with other people if our relationship with God was determined by how we treat other people people, we would never receive that grace. <laughs> but God is savage because His love that is free and fierce cannot be controlled, and that love is given to whomever God chooses, which, by the way, happens to be everybody. And so if we treated others like God, if we, if God treated us like we treat other people, guess what would happen? No grace for you. The very nature of God being faithful to us and being faithful to us despite ourselves is, is what is supposed to inspire us to be faithful to Him. But when we're faithful to Him, we are called upon to be faithful to other people. So if we're unfaithful to other people and our grace and our love for other people, then we're being unfaithful to God. Do you get where I'm going with that? <laughs> it's kind of crazy, right? I laugh because I know as a church of people, this is our greatest struggle. 
Because for centuries, we've been so fixated on my personal relationship with God that we forget about the personal relationship of, that we're supposed to have with other people. And we forget that that grace is given to us so that we can give that grace to other people. And that we're not allowed to hold it back. We are not in the space or part of our lives where we are allowed to hold that back. Because last time I checked, I'm not perfect, you're not perfect, and the only perfect person is God's presence within our lives. I did a wedding on Friday. I did a wedding on Friday for a man who is, um, and his wife, he was in the army and he has PTSD. And I'm, I'm, I, he finally pulled me aside. I'm like, why are you so anxious? You know, besides the fact that he was getting married and he had to stand up in front of a bunch of people. He said, I never, ever, ever imagined that I would be in this place. I'm like, what do you mean? He goes, Chuck, you don't know the things that I've seen. Chuck, you don't know the things that I've been ordered to do. And I have never imagined that I would be in this place getting married to the love of my life and be as fortunate and as blessed as I am right now. I always thought that God would, would never accept me. I believe that God would always hold back from me because of what I've seen and what I've had to do. Because I'm in a place right now in my life that I'm just absolutely amazed that I'm even here. He was practically in tears. He was overwhelmed by the fact that he was in this place. And he knew something that we as Christians have a hard time realizing. He knew that he didn't deserve it, but he got it anyway. That's amazing. That's absolutely amazing. And so, this unbelievable, savage grace of God meets us right where we are, to love us right where we are, no matter where we've been, no matter what's happened, no matter what's going on, and no matter what path we choose to be in. God meets us right there to show us and to allow us to experience the undeserved unreserved, savage grace and love of God. Unbelievable. Phenomenal. Awesome. It should compel us. It should force us to focus on what really matters. And so what really matters is to connect people with Christ, right? Right? grow them in their faith and to serve our community. So let's stand together as Eileen, we're going to sing verse 3 of How Great Thou Art. I think you can see the theme here. <laughs>
so here's the funny thing about this grace thing. God loves you right where you are. God loves you no matter what you do. God loves you, and God, there's nothing you can do in your life to make him love you more, and there's nothing that you can do to make him love you less. And here's what's significant about that grace. Here's, a, here's where we get in trouble, is when we don't believe we deserve that grace, and guess what? We don't believe anybody else deserves that grace either. So God is savage with his grace, meaning he chooses to love you no matter what. So I need you to hear that this morning. I need you to know that God loves you unconditionally. That will never end, by the way. So if you're struggling right now with that, I want you to know that you're loved. I want you to know that God loves you with everything in him. So much so that he was willing to go to the cross and die there and be resurrected so you could experience life. I want you to know that. I am so grateful for that. But I also want you to know that when we don't believe that and trust that, we can't do that for other people. So the first place you need to start in your lives is to realize there's something messed up in you before you can begin to point out in other people how messed up they are. Because it's easier for us to point out other people and how messed up they are before we realize there's something messed up in me. Well, not me, you. <laughs> I already know I'm messed up, guys. But when we realize this grace is enough for us, then we realize, oh my God, it's enough for those people in my life that we don't believe deserve it. By the way, none of us do. Let's just be real. But God gives it to us anyway. So, God, take us from here in the light of your love and your grace so that we can be grace in the world and make it this grace not about me, but about changing the world around me with this unbelievable, fierce, love that you have for the world, the whole world, every being in this world. And I pray this, God, in your son's name. Amen.